Hello and welcome to Can You Hear Me at the Back, the podcast about all things voice and communication. Hello and welcome to another episode of Can You Hear Me at the Back. Uh, unfortunately, Leon isn't with us because he's teaching and doing amazing, wonderful things. But I have with me today Sylvie, um, who's been incredible and so that she's going to come on. We're going to have a wonderful chat about diversity and inclusivity um, and voice training and things of that nature. Um, so Sylvie. What we do normally um, is we do um, a sound and a movement to kind of express how we feel at this moment in time. <laughs> so do you have a sound and movement? I'll, I'll describe the movement. Okay. Mm, man, I haven't done this in ages. <laughs> my master's there. Um, okay. <sighs> That's, <laughs> that's so nice. You're a lot less stressed than I am, I feel like. Um, mine, is, mine is a... Um, which is me just shaking my head. Just give us like a little introduction to like who you are, how you kind of a brief thing and how you came into voice um, and, uh, and, and a little bit of what you do now. Sure. Um, so my name's Sylvie. I have my own business called SLVC Voice Training in London. Um, I also trained where Andrea and Leon trained at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama for my master's in voice. And so I did that between 2015 and 2017. I'm originally from Canada. So I had studied acting in Vancouver and I also had my BA in speech communications, which was very interesting because it's completely led me down a completely linear path of understanding how I fell into voice and once I finished my training like most uh, traditional voice teachers teach in uh, academia and the performing arts and so I worked in a musical theater college for a while um, I found that it was really really interesting but also at the same time I felt like something was missing and I think because my family was all corporate and in finance and I didn't fit in into that little slot in the world I found a way to bridge my work and the language and how I speak to people who are used to be working in that world who are non-performers and use the knowledge and the talent that I have from voice training and help them be better communicators in the business world and that's kind of what I do now <laughs> wow um I didn't know you were in musical I didn't know you did um you were teaching in musical theater before yeah no I did that for about just under a year right yeah right um and was there like a crazy difference when you went from kind of music because I always imagine going from musical theater to like corporate is like <laughs> <laughs> there's a massive difference in there but I don't, I don't really know I didn't make that I haven't made that like leap yet I think the massive difference is between performer world and also non-performer and investment banker completely mm -hmm. different because a lot of them never cross over and also even when I was studying acting um the people at the school we just fought in different ways I think because of our training my background I already had finished a liberal arts degree and so I thought very differently than just going into a boot camp and learning tech tips and tricks and techniques of acting on screen or in a live uh, room. So I think the main difference is literally those two worlds. And what has prepped me really well is being raised in a family that speaks in that corporate non-performer language and lingo and the morals and values of being raised in a Chinese Canadian household in a way and it just really prepared me a lot more to be aligned with the thinking of somebody who works in an office nine to five um, how they speak to their friends how they speak to their own colleagues and how different it is than what we talk about in terms of breath and how we can start to tailor how we talk about breath with these people because they understand what breath is but something like yoga is a little bit more accessible to them something that takes um just as much courage, you know, to let the breath drop in. Mm -hmm. But when you ask them to stand with soft knees and feel, you know, the bottoms of their feet, it's um, it's a little bit different. So finding your way around that is uh, probably the key. <laughs> but, um, and, and it kind of seems to me that that's, that's a very creative thing to do as well, like to try to find something that is a little bit more elusive and kind of ambiguous in a way that we do in kind of acting in drama schools and make it a little bit more concrete and, um, and kind of finite um, and digestible for people. Like you're really working an a incredible creative muscle there trying to figure out, okay, so maybe if it's not softening feet, maybe it's just standing and I don't, I don't know what language you would use for that, but that seems like <laughs> <laughs> something that is quite um, unique and creative in and of itself. 
Yeah, and I think it really depends on the individual if they trust you. And um, because sometimes I can use really, really artsy, really fluffy language, and they're okay with it. it. You really have to listen to what they need and what they want, what type of person they are, as well as what is their comfort zone. Because if all of a sudden someone who's completely logical and analytical, you tell them to. Oh, just close your eyes and imagining the eyelids softening on top of your eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, it works if you come with a spin on mindfulness, but it's it's really it, you really have to be able to think <laughs> on your <laughs> on your feet. And um, and I think it's a it's something that drives me a lot is being able to come up with something new all the time so that it doesn't become you know, old, because sometimes when we have curriculums in academia, I get quite bored with that because I like to always think about something new. And also there's so many, um, you know, there's all this political stuff about what you teach and what you don't teach and what teacher yeah. teaches what and what you are aligned with. So something that's been amazing for working by myself and for myself and for the people that I'm teaching is that everything is always different for each person. And that's actually how I approached my work at the musical theater school. I had like 400 students um, because I got left with all of them um, during the circumstance and the situation I was in. Uh, but my ethos and philosophy in teaching is always to personalize it. So I gave myself so much more work, but honestly, even though I was exhausted from it, it gave me so much more richness uh, of fulfillment that I could help every individual know each person's name, could actually write something individual in the comments when I was doing feedback forms. Um, and that's actually... I think has helped me get to the success that I've got from um, from what I've been doing recently. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I feel that. I also teach an enormous amount of students. And sometimes you're looking at your comment sheets and you're just kind of like, uh, <laughs> like how long is it going to take me to say everything that I need to say? But I do, I also find the thing that you said um, incredibly helpful where, but I think also as like a student and that having been a well, I wasn't a student that recently, but like having been a student um, that I feel like the feedback that I got from any of my teachers when it was more personal, I understood and I digested it better. And I took on that feedback rather than it being just like, I don't know, um, make sure you're not glottalizing at the end of things where it's just kind of like that could be generic stuff for everybody. Um, do you find that like that helps you in terms of kids. We're having this big discussion, I think, in drama schools like all over, but particularly in voice um, about diversity and inclusion. So do you feel like that's part of kind of the story of diversity and inclusion is kind of bringing um, a sense of personal to your work and bringing, um, I don't know, like aspects of who you are into what you do rather than it just kind of being like, well, this is voice. This is what you need to do to do a presentation. And this is, you know, this is how you become the, the best, I don't know, leader or corporate person that you can be without having, I guess, your input in any of that. Yeah, that um, that makes a lot of sense to me because that is how I teach. I teach from my own perspective, which is, as you can see from the outset, that I'm multicultural. And then you hear me speak and a different accent comes out, although the English is fluent. I'm in a completely different country where my accent is not natural. I've been implanted here. Um, when you go into the schools, you have people from all over the country, all different accents. And for me, when I moved here, I had no idea that there was more than one accent just never thought about it but also because I'm not from America we don't have as many regions to really say I'm this accent from this region um, in Canada yes there are different places where they speak a different language or in a different accent completely but um, the part between British Columbia and Ontario and the Maritimes it sounds generically kind of the same but obviously there are differences in, in you know the qualities of the different accents and when I was here I think what helped people to take me in more was that everything that I taught them was a skill. And it was also through me analyzing and observing, not me coming in, telling them that this is the right way to do it. I speak in an RP accent. I grew up with RP accent. I grew up with all these cultures and values and therefore learn from me, and especially if there's international students. Um, some of them have confided in me that 
it's easier to learn from you because you are different, but you can see that I could put a skill on and I can still speak the same after. And I find that this parallel runs true between both performance uh, students and also my clients who are in corporate. It's just to really understand that you don't need to be ashamed of your identity, but to be able to tap into understanding that you can learn things as a skill. But so much of the stuff like accent is so connected to our own identities it's really hard to sometimes unwind that psychology and um and that's really what i've been working with when i'm teaching most of the people i'm teaching yeah do you get a lot of because um i mean i i used to teach like voice and performance at central um which has like older and kind of like um more of a corporate feel less of performance feel but i mean you you get elements of both people in it, but I get a lot of people um, with accent reduction work um, coming in being like, well, I want to sound like so-and-so because I feel like that will make me more authoritative or like, I want to sound like this person because, you know, they're on, I don't know, they're on this show and that's what I want to, that's what I want to be like. Uh, how do you tackle that? Like, do, I mean, do you, do you even touch it? Like, I don't, I don't know. Uh, so number one, I don't call it accent reduction. Um, I don't like the word elocution, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do say accent softening and accent mm-hmm. shifting. And a lot of people who've heard me say that say, oh my gosh, Sylvie, can I coin that? Because I, I know I don't want to steal it from you, but I never really thought about it as shifting. Yeah. And I think of it as shifting because I am shifting sounds when I'm shifting my sounds to sound different. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just, a, I think for myself, an easier way to think about it rather than saying, I need to reduce my sound or I need to reduce myself because that your voice is your identity your accent is part of your voice I think um, finding the right ways to frame it and get the right language and the words also helps you in your teaching um, there are also also different types of companies that teach in different ways and my ethos and philosophy is not to be ashamed of who you are and understand that your mother tongue is a talent that you have a skill that you have that perhaps when people don't understand you they just don't have the skill either to listen to um, a type of English that is perhaps more influenced by Indian sounds, um, by Italian sounds, by French sounds, or by Spanish sounds, or by South American Spanish sounds. Mm -hmm. And when you start to think about it from that point of view, I think it starts to open up the mind a little bit to know, oh, okay, well, unless somebody told me that my accent is bad, usually it's something that comes up within the self that comes up with this negative mindset of oh my voice is not enough my accent's not enough um so with that said accent reduction I think the way that I've worded myself on my website and how I sell my services and and telling people about what I do I don't usually attract those people Mm -hmm. or if they are asking for accent reduction, um, they can type it to me that way in my contact form, but I won't be saying the same thing to them, or I might teach them, but also it could seem quite patronizing. So you just have to figure out what the fine balance is of how it works for you and how you want to teach it. Cause some people kind of want to ram it into your throat <laughs> that, Oh, this is not what I use. Yeah. Um, some people just don't touch it, but then I think it depends how important it, it is to you for you to address it or not. It's up to you. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing. I never, um, I never thought of it as, uh, as like, and I've heard of accent softening, but I've never heard of people using it as accent shifting, which is actually really what we're asking people to do. It's that we're asking, you know, you're asking about, you're talking about like code switching. You're talking about different um, uh, elements and uh, different situations where we're using one accent over a different accent um, for various different social reasons. So that's a, that's a really interesting um, and valid point. That I should really, <laughs> I should really incorporate into, um, into my own thing, um, into my own stuff because I, I'm, I don't know, like I mean, you kind of touched on it and being Canadian, but when I moved to the UK, um, there was something in me too where I was kind of like, um, I was one of maybe two people that looked the way I did, just being like African American, well, being being black of some kind. Um, and I particularly identify as African American, um, but then also I was the I was one of the few like Americans that were there, um, and then I was also from the East Coast, which made a, which made a big difference. Um, and so, the, and then I started to kind you start to kind of see yourself in all the in all the ways that are different, 
You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Where you kind of, you start to walk into a classroom, you go, oh, well, I'm not like this. I'm not like this. I'm not like this. I'm not like this. And I was seeing that a lot in my students who I also had a very similar experience to you where they were coming up to me and they're like, oh my gosh, like I feel really great about voice and I feel really great about accent because like for the first time, somebody who didn't look like me was teaching um, or who looked or who resembled me in some kind of way as being kind of not your standard, I think, um, quote unquote voice teacher that we think about in our head when we think about a voice teacher. Um, yeah. You look a little bit different and you sound a little bit different. Um, and coming from a place, which I think um, you do as well, of kind of not being the authority on any on anything or everything and kind of being like, well, let's explore that. Let's unpack that. Let's um, let's kind of get to the self, you know, and what you're, and what you want your voice to express about you. Um, and yeah, no, I, so I completely resonate with that. Uh, I was also wondering if it's, um, just kind of like how you felt about, um, um, about your voice and kind of exploring your voice, um, since you've been, since you moved here, but also since kind of, um, you've been teaching like has has there been a shift between like Sylvie before teaching and then Sylvie after teaching or like before UK and after UK like I was just curious I think um that's an interesting question because I had studied voice and I had done an intensive voice program Mm -hmm. for about five weeks in Canada the national voice intensive and that's where my voice shifted it was before the master's I found it to be quite difficult doing the master's because not everyone worked on their voice prior to going into the program Mm -hmm. so there was a lot of um, a mix of, of different things happening. So when whilst I was at the program, I felt like I didn't really have that much of a voice, to be completely honest, because one, I was the only Canadian there. Two, I'm Chinese Canadian, so that there's there were no other Chinese people or Asian people in the class. And um, I felt like I really had to discover how I fit into the UK rather than just think of myself as an international student. So not just thinking about the the surface of what my voice sounds like but what is my voice and what can I talk about because I wasn't getting a lot of the education behind understanding what my diversity was and how that filtered into how I should be voicing myself because no one can tell you how to do it but it just wasn't addressed Mm -hmm. so I was stuck um, thinking about that on my own a lot and coming from Canada and I'm sure in America as well we talk a lot about um, um, colonizing and uh, (laughs) decolonizing and all that so it's been very interesting my my husband is actually British and we talk a lot about this I'm sure he doesn't enjoy as much as I do but (laughs) um, but when we talk about that and just understanding sometimes the voice of privilege and the voice of you know using the language that we're using and what type of quality that we're putting on that might be privileged because sometimes we're not asking questions sometimes we're making statements even though you're not asking those questions and you're framing it as asking the question Mm -hmm. then that communication starts to go haywire Mm -hmm. because we don't know where that's going anymore um so finding my voice was a very very difficult time for me whilst I was directly in the program at the school once I kind of broke away I found uh, my voice in teaching to be very very cool I found it to be very cool um, because you are now with a different audience who sees you as somebody with knowledge and if your peers value what you have and what you can teach and the rapport you can have with your students if you have it some people don't have it mm-hmm. um, then you feel like you belong and I think that is just the human thing of feeling like you belong so therefore you have your voice again mm-hmm. um, so I think when I left was when I did find my voice um, I didn't completely work on my voice honestly like I did when I was heavily training it whilst I was in acting school but I think the the experience I've had in probably the last three years in working with corporates it has helped me to develop a more authoritative sound because my journey with using my voice was coming from a little girl's place to finding the woman's sound. And even in my singing, I was singing more in a girl's place rather than connecting to the full lower tones and, and really embracing that. So I, I have a feeling that even though I look young, I'm small in, in stature, but the way that I come across in my communication and my voice is 
tenfold so different mm -hmm. from when I was studying. And I think that's where the de development like happened for me. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't about pitch changes, wasn't about pacing, but mostly that. Yeah. Yeah. This is an interesting thing because I felt the exact same way. And I had I, I had a similar experience in that I had come um, I'd come from a place of apologizing a lot of times for being in a room um, and um, being told that I was too loud or I was too this, you know, I was, I was too whatever. So my instinct to, when I walked into a room was to, was to make myself smaller and to make my voice quite small um, to compensate for that thing. And then when I started teaching, I, I felt like I could to kind of expand because I was like an authority figure and it, and it was this big thing um, and that you could be safer. But that was like, that was really great. Um, and um, thank you for sharing that because <laughs> you didn't have to share your journey, but that was um, that was really insightful um, and stuff. So I think um, I think that's where I'm going to end it. Unless you have any other thoughts or um, things that you would like to share. Um, well, I suppose the only thing is try to love your voice because a lot of people don't love them mm -hmm. and it's really hard to build vocal confidence. But once you find a coach that, um, you know, will work with you in the right way and has the same values, it's just like finding any coach. It's not just to find someone who has the talent or the skill, but someone who listens to you and that you're on the right page. And so hopefully I hope that you learn to love your voice to whoever who's listening out there. And, um, and yeah, I think I'll leave you there with that. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, it's like, it's always a joy to talk to you. You're so smart and insightful and you have all these wonderful um, insights into voice and um, and things. And especially I think coming as um, minorities into a world that's kind of full of um, people who don't look like us or sound like us. Uh, it's always really great to have another person there just kind of like um, talk about your journey and also just, um, and also just kind of um, be a, a sounding board and, and, I don't know, and, and having lived through the experience. Um, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was really lovely chatting with you too. I, you know, I remember meeting you at, like in person at the Midlands Voice Conference. And that was such a really cool experience to have because then I could see what you did and it resonated so well. And we all have such different stories. Yeah. Um, and I think that was probably, I was just like, oh, I finally met her because I was seeing you everywhere. And I was just like, oh, this is really cool. And knowing that we have, you know, similarities, even though they're different, mm -hmm. will help us be more strong and understand how we need to teach uh, so that we can help everybody who's, who is different, who does not fit whatever that the normal standard was of how voice used to be taught. And I'm really looking forward to, you know, brainstorming and exploring that further with you. Yeah, me too. Um, thank you so much, Sylvie. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> If you want to contact us about anything we said in the podcast, you can reach us on Twitter at Can You Hear Pod or on Instagram at Can You Hear Me Podcast. Or you can search for us on Facebook and on YouTube. Or email us at Can You Hear Me at the back at gmail.com. You can find me, Leon, on Twitter at Leon Trayman. Or me, Andrea, at Andrea Fudge on Twitter. Please support the podcast by subscribing as a patron on our Patreon site. The link is in the show notes to keep the podcast advertisement free as well as get access to cool extra stuff discounts bonus episodes as well as supporting ongoing voice research funding as well okay love you bye